Welcome uh, to another of our uh, Clean Code Talks. And today we're going to talk about basically a uh, fancy way of saying dependency injection. But I don't want to use the word dependency injection because people kind of have preconceived ideas of what it is. Uh, so instead, let's talk, get to the basics and talk about what exactly, why exactly certain things make code really, really hard to test. In order to test the method, the first thing you have to do is instantiate it. Uh, and that seems like something very, very obvious, but it turns out that people tend to put all kinds of crazy things in the constructor, which makes the instantiation process really, really difficult. Not only do they put things in the constructor, people put code into static initialization classes, which makes the code, again, even harder to instantiate because the static initialization class probably goes out and reaches to some kind of singleton and expects it to be initialized, and so on and so forth. So the first thing we have to do in order to test any kind of instance methods um, is to instantiate the class. All right, let's get to some fun code and let's talk about this thing. Um, suppose you have a, a piece of code like this and you want to instantiate uh, a document. Presumably document is used somewhere else, like let's say a printer. A printer wants a document in order to print it. So the document says, well, I need a URL. And it goes on and instantiates an HTML client and says, hey, HTML client, would you be so kind and go fetch this URL and give me the content? And now I'm going to save the content in my local field. How would you test this? Any suggestions in, from the audience? Well, you would have to write a test server, right? You would actually have to instantiate a, a web server that comes up, and you would have to set up the test server with some uh, document that you want, and then you would have to instantiate the document and then pass the URL that's going to have a local host to some port and so on. Do you, anybody see a problem with this, how cumbersome the whole process is? Uh, so we need to do something about this to make this thing easier to instantiate. So any suggestions? Well, what we can do is we can uh, in, uh, ask for HTML client in the constructor. And we can say, hey, uh, I need the HTML client. And in the test, I can ask for a mock HTML client and say, hey, uh, I'm going to override the get method. And when you ask for a URL, I'm going to return you a, uh, a document that you, we already need. Now, the reason why the previous slide we could have, could not have tested, and the, this slide we have, is that in the previous slide we have simply instantiated something that we wanted, whereas in the next slide we said, we don't care about how this thing gets instantiated. All we say is, we need one of these in order to get our work done. Uh, and so this particular thing is a lot more testable than the previous one, because I can always pass in a mock HTML client. But, uh, even though we, can, we, can, we got rid of a server, we still kind of have a problem here. And that is, every time we need to instantiate a document, we have to instantiate in a mock HTTP client. We have to prime it with, a, with an expectation to get a call to a get and a URL and so on and so forth, and uh, have it primed to return the, the value which we want. So to make this thing better, uh, how about we just get rid of the whole client.get URL, and instead, uh, <coughs> We simply say the document wants HTML. That makes the instantiation really, really easy because I can simply say new document, ask for the, the HTML code that I want, and uh, shove it into my field variable that I need. Now, the reason I know what I need is because the, the stuff that I need is what I save in my fields. Anything else I ask in the constructor and I don't save in the field it really means that I'm only needing something from there in order to traverse something else and fetch the stuff that I really want. So what you want to end up with is uh, a document like one over here, which simply says, I need an HTML, which you can then store in a string. Now, the reason why this is important is because you a lot of other objects depend on a document. Suppose you have a printer. And if, a, if you want to instantiate a printer and test out a print method, you presumably have to pass in a document. And it would be really nice if I could simply say, new document, pass in the HTML into the document's constructor, which I want to print, and then test to see if the printer works properly. I don't want to go and mark out all the pieces over and over again. But let's get back to this, doc this document over here for a second. Uh, what we're doing here is we're mixing 
the object graph construction with object lookup. Instead of asking what we need, we are constructing it ourselves. And I want to demonstrate this uh, through this particular class. <laughs> Imagine that just like a document, you had a class called a car, and just like HTML client, you had a class called engine factory. And the car wanted to get a hold of the engine. Uh, in the previous class, what we did is we instantiated the engine, the, doc, the HTTP client, which in this case is the engine factory. Now, isn't this a little bizarre that a car knows how to build a factory and then asks the factory to build an engine, which then it saves inside of itself? I, I find this rather bizarre. Uh, but somehow, when we are dealing with abstract concepts, such as a document, HTTP client, and so on, we easily make this mistake and um, we don't kind of notice this is a problem. It's only when we deal with concrete objects do we realize just how silly it is for a constructor to be asking for the factory or something that produces something instead of asking for the item directly. So again, if you just ask for the things that you want, the construction becomes really easy because at that point you can simply call a new operator, you instantiate the object, you pass in all of the references that you need. Uh, and then once you have the document, you can easily pass it into the printer or anybody else that needs it. Now, the reason why this is important is because there are many objects. Uh, tests are all about instantiating small portions of your application, right? It's the same drill every single time. You instantiate a small portion of your application, you, you poke out the objects a little bit, and then you assert some output. You instantiate some other piece of portion of the application, poke at it, and assert some output. And if the instantiation portion is difficult, you're going to find it really hard to test different pieces. And even if it's not that if, if the document is difficult, it's going to be difficult to write document test. It's going to be anything, it's going to be hard to test anything which needs the document directly or indirectly. So it's a kind of a transitive problem, right? So one bad apple can really ruin it for everybody else. This is basically talking about the test driver, the, the printer, and the document, uh, again, in more detail, which simplifies, right? You simply instantiate the test driver, you instantiate your printer, you instantiate your document, and you pass the document through the printer. In the old setup, you would have to instantiate the document, uh, the HTTP client, which is your friendly, which would return the stuff that you need into the document and then pass it into the printer. That just makes the whole process a lot more convoluted and difficult to deal with. So the first problem in testing is really that the test has to successfully navigate the constructor each time instance is needed. And therefore, we really, really want to make sure that in our tests, the, new, the, the constructors are really simple. Preferably, ideally, we would like to have nothing but uh, assignments inside of the constructor. You simply ask for what you need, and you save it into your local variable, in your local field, uh, and you're done with it. So now let's look at something called a service locator. Uh, first of all, how many people know what service locator is? OK. So <clears throat> service locator says basically, well, there's all these objects which are really hard to instantiate or hard to get a hold of. So maybe instead of uh, instantiating them directly or having them as a singleton, and we already talked about how singletons are hard to test, we could maybe go and uh, pa uh, store the responsibility of getting these objects with the service locator, and then we simply pass the service locator around. That gives us a seam because we can always override an operation on our service locator and then return the object of interest. The problem is that the service locator encourages uh, APIs which lie. Uh, you know, because you simply have a class that says, I need a service locator. And then you look at the APIs without looking at the source code, and you say, gee, I wonder what I need to override in order to make that class testable. And you have no idea. You simply either have to look at the source code, or you have to run the code to see where it crashes in your test in order to figure out what needs to be overwritten. Um, it also becomes difficult to wire different objects together in the test, because while in the constructor you can simply say, I need A, B, and C, and then simply instantiate those things, with the service locator you now have to instantiate those things, but you're not quite sure in which order you have to instantiate them in, and then you have to train the service locator to return them. Um, and, fin and finally, uh, the service locator 
violates the law of Demeter. Instead of asking for the things you want, you're always asking for the service locator and then reaching through the service locator to get the object of interest. So let's have a look what that looks like. By the way, sometimes a service locator is known as a context. Um, and I just want to point out, it is a much better uh, paradigm than having a global state where you store your singletons in. Uh, so it's much better than global lookup. At least your code is testable, but it's kind of hard to test. Um, and it, it hides the true dependencies, which, as I pointed out, it makes the APIs lie about what they actually do. So let's have a look. Suppose you have a house, and a house and the constructor says, I need a locator. Uh, what do we have to override in a locator in order to construct the house? No idea. You really need to know what is inside of the constructor to figure this out. Uh, so if you know that you have door, window, and roof in your fields, then you, you can kind of figure out, yeah, yeah, I, I see. I need to override the get door, get window, and get roof. So from a testing point of view, well, before we get to test, this is how the API lies, right? This is what, what we mean by that. It says, all I need is a service locator, and everything is happy. Um, from a testing point of view, you have to still instantiate the door, roo uh, roof, and window, but then you have to instantiate the locator. And in some way, you either have to set the parameters on the locator, or you have to override the methods, uh, depending on whether it's an interface or not, um, and then it pass the house into it. Now, suppose a house all of a sudden had a new dependency on, let's say, plumbing. Well, if you had a new dependency on plumbing, then uh, you would simply declare it in your constructor, and you would immediately know which tests do not compile, because now there's a new parameter in the constructor. And you could go into those tests and then fix them. Whereas if now house needs a plumbing and reaches into the service locator to fetch the plumbing, everything still compiles, but random tests all over the place are starting to fail, and you are not quite sure why. Uh, it's not exactly obvious that all of a sudden there's a new dependency that was added, and you have to deal with them in this test. Uh, the other way of looking at the service locator is basically that all the objects basically, uh, suppose you wanted to reuse a house and give it to somebody else. Uh, that means you have to give the person not just the house, but also all the compile time dependencies. So now house depends on a service locator. So now you, know, you, just, you can't just give somebody a house to reuse. You also have to give them the service locator. But the service locator knows about all the other services and objects and et cetera, whether the house needs them or not, the service locator knows about them. So now you are, have a problem that in order to give somebody a house, you have to give them a service locator. In order to give them a service locator, you have to give them basically your whole application. Not very reusable. So now let's look at it the same exact thing, but this time in the constructor we specify things that we actually need. We say we need a, do a door, window, and a roof. I don't need to look into the source code or run the code to kind of figure out what I have to instantiate. Uh, this is very obvious. Uh, so, as a matter of fact, I can simply just look at the Java doc and say, oh yeah, that's kind of what I need. It kind of makes sense that the house needs a door, window, and a roof. Yeah, I, I can see that, and I'm simply going to go on call the constructors on these. So our test becomes much, much nicer, right? All of that stuff regarding service locator, the overriding or setting or whatever, they just disappeared. And now we're just dealing with what we want. I personally prefer this kind of API. It makes it really easy for me to instantiate objects and work with them. Because when I instantiate a, a house in a test, I immediately know what else needs to be instantiated. Not only that, I have a choice in my test whether to pass a null for any particular object or the real value. Suppose I'm testing the painting uh, method of the house. Uh, presumably, I don't need a roof for that, so I simply can pass in a null for roof. And that basically tells the reader of the test that if something goes wrong, you don't look into the roof. That's not the, where the problem is, because I didn't even give you one. So the thing with service locator is that we are mixing the responsibility of object lookup and object creation. And from a testing point of view, we automatically need either an interface, or we need to override it to mock it, or we need to have a service locator which basically has a whole bunch of setter methods where we can externally set the dependencies. And of course, as I pointed out, anything which depends on a service locator now depends on everything else, whether you like it or not. <clears throat> 
By the way, people have lots of different names for this thing. So sometimes they call it the registry, the locator, the context, the manager, the handler, the environment, the principal, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, all different names, uh, same exact idea. Uh, not asking for what you want, but really asking for this intermediate service object, which then knows about the whole world. So now, let's talk about law of Demeter for a second. So imagine you're in a store, and the item you're purchasing is 25 bucks. Do you give the clerk a 25 bucks, or do you give the clerk your wallet and let him retrieve the $25? Yes, Paul? You give them your wallet and you let them retrieve the $25. In the Why is that? In, a, in the form of a credit card. In the form of a credit card. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think most of us will agree uh, that you really want to give the clerk $25, right? Uh, that makes it much easier from a testing point of view as well. So let's have a look. Suppose you have a purchase method and there's a customer, and the purchase method says, okay, give me a customer and I'm going to reach into the wallet and get the money and I'm going to record some sale or something of that sort, right? Now, from a testing point of view, uh, we need to now create a customer. So uh, we need to create a customer, we need to create a, a wallet, and we need to shove money into the wallet, and then we can kind of uh, test this. I, I imagine this thing, it's kind of like, imagine you have a haystack, and like you properly position a needle somewhere in the haystack, and then it's, it's, a, it's an understanding between you and the code that you know how to traverse the haystack to get to the needle that you want, right? All the stuff around it is really irrelevant. I mean, nobody cares about the customer or the wallet, they just want the 25 bucks, but nevertheless, we instantiate this, this monstrosity that goes around it in order to get to our $25. Not very interesting test. Not to mention there's so many objects going on, it's kind of hard to figure out if anything goes wrong, what, what, is, what went bad. Now, what happens if we change the purchase to simply say, hey, I need the money? Presumably the $25, right? From a testing point of view, this greatly simplifies things, right? I no longer have to instantiate the customer, the wallet, or anything else. Now, this is kind of a toy example that I'm placing up here, but imagine in the real world where the instantiation of a customer constructor doesn't just take a wallet, but takes 10 other things, right? Uh, so, and suppose the customer in insists on having, uh, doing null checking to make sure you can't pass in nulls for all the other parameters. And suppose the constructor does real work where it tries to authenticate something from a database, right? All of a sudden, having the previous test makes it really, really difficult because you have to pass in a customer and you can't even construct a customer because of all the things we've talked about uh, in previous half an hour. So really, you really wanna make sure that you really just ask for the objects that you directly need to get your work done. Uh, you certainly don't want to ask for the intermediate object and then reach through that object to get the item that you want. And fundamentally, that's what's wrong with the service locator, is that you're always asking for something that you don't want or you don't need directly, only to retrieve the things that you want out of it. So the law of the meter basically says you should always ask for the objects you directly need, the ones you're going to operate on, the ones you're going to dispatch methods on, right? Uh, the dead giveaway is if you have a dot get dot whatever, right? I mean, typically we have a service locator dot get customer repository dot get customer by ID, pass in 37. Good luck testing that. Uh, and so dependency injection is basically what saves you from all this because it allows you to have all the methods simply ask for the object that you want. So here's a little myth that everybody has, and that is dependency injection makes refactoring hard, and the myth goes that if a child object now needs a new parameter, then I have to pass it through all of its parents. That's what the myth says, or at least that's what uh, people first uh, think about when you, ask, when you say that all of the dependencies should be declared explicitly in the constructor. However, what, what, what this myth is, is missing is that if you are passing something along just because there's some child object that needs it, you're breaking the law of Demeter, right? Because you are not supposed to know about anything that you don't directly need. And so the myth says that you have now this, that the dependency injection makes it harder because it makes you pass things around that you don't need, but the law of Demeter says you shouldn't do this. So let's see how we can reconcile this. 
so first, again, let's have our example of house door and a doorknob. And suppose that all of a sudden the doorknob, uh, so by, by the way, first of all, to instantiate this, this tree, you would have some kind of a factory, and you would simply instantiate the doorknob, you'd pass it into the door, and you pass it in the house, and now the house uh, is constructed with all the parameters that it needs. Now suppose the doorknob all of a sudden needs a color, and a door needs a window, or something like that, right? The myth says this is going to put pressure on a house, because now house has to ask for all these parameters to pass it through. But that's wrong, right? Because the house isn't the one responsible for constructing these things. And that's the key difference. House simply says, I need a door. As a matter of fact, house is, even, is not even aware that door has a doorknob. So from a factory point of view, I now have to instantiate the color and, and the small window to fit inside of, of, the, of the door. But notice how it doesn't actually affect the house. So contrary to what you would think, by explicitly the asking for your dependencies in the constructor, it actually makes it easier to add parameters, not harder. And the reason for this is because all of your business logic uh, doesn't deal with object lookup or the construction, right? The business logic simply says, I need all these things. And then somewhere else is a factory that's responsible for wiring the pieces together. Now at this point, many people say, aha, but now I have one factory per class, so now I have twice as many classes. That's not true either. Notice again how one factory serves a whole bunch of objects. Typically, you actually have, in theory, you actually all you need is one factory for all of the objects of the same lifetime. In practice, we would really have ridiculously large factories, and so we break it down further. Uh, but nevertheless, the point is, you really only need one factory plus a couple of breakdowns of the classes that are not ridiculously large uh, per uh, object lifetime. And in typical application, you have your uh, long-lived objects. You have your session, if you have a web application, your session scoped objects. And you have your request scope objects. Plus, you have some objects that are really short-lived, uh, but typically those are rare. You typically just stick to your request scope. Uh, so in theory, you can get away with four factories in, the, in such an application. A couple of rules about uh, object construction. So you only really want to inject objects whose lifetime is equal or greater than yours. So in your constructor, if you're asking for, uh, if you're a house and you're asking for a door, it is assumed that the lifetime of the door is at least as long as that of a house, if not greater. Uh, you can get into some really troublesome spots if you uh, break that rule. So if you have an object that needs to have a shorter lifetime, you typically pass that through a stack. Or uh, you simply break your object graph in some kind of a different structure so that you group your equally lived objects together. So that you, you simply instantiate all the equally, equal lifetime objects together. And then you say, now do the work that you need to do, get done. So you have two basically phases. Let's talk about other common practice that people do, and that is uh, paranoid programming. Uh, so people love to put null checks everywhere. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, we have a house, and there's a precondition check that says, make sure that somebody, whoever constructed you, gave you a real door. That seems like a good idea, but it turns out, actually, that from a testing point of view, it makes my test much harder to deal with. Suppose I have, uh, I have a house, and I want to paint the house the color red, and I want to assert that the, the house color is red after I painted it. Presumably, that has nothing to do with door. So I should be able to simply say, create a house and pass in a null door, because the door is not involved for this particular method. It's involved with other methods, but not with this one. It prevents me from actually doing this, because I need to the, the, the precondition will throw an exception. Um, so these kinds of preconditions actually make it hard for you to instantiate your objects. To put it differently, I prefer an application that I know that it works because I have a whole bunch of tests to prove it that it works, rather than have an application that I think it works because there is uh, precondition checks everywhere. 
executable checks in form of a test are always more valuable than having a preconditioned check. Now, people always say, well, what if it's an external-based API? Uh, rules might be different. You know, your mileage may vary. If, if you are really creating an API for an external world where people are going to be calling you, it makes a lot of sense to put preconditioned checks inside of your uh, methods. But if this is your internal API that your application uses internally, what you're really saying is that you don't trust yourself. And so those checks tend to just hinder your testing than, than make it, rather than make it easier. Also, as I pointed out earlier, is if you come across a test like this and you see new house, new door, you're not quite sure if the door is involved in this particular test or not. Like, is the door involved in painting? You're not sure, right? And so by passing in a null, you're making it clear to the user that door has nothing to do with the particular test I'm doing. And that's, I believe, a valuable information to be passed on. So I like to think of it this particular way, that in production code, right, the code that I expect to ship, I really don't want to get in the business of passing nulls. I always want to pass, you know, don't pass a null, rather give me an empty collection. Uh, don't give me a null for a logger, rather give me a logger that doesn't do anything. Uh, so in production code, you always should assume that you're getting a real object that you can call methods on. And if you, for your particular configuration, feel like that that particular object doesn't need to do anything, uh, then have a null value object that simply uh, creates no ops for all the methods you call on it. Which will also then mean that you should not ever have to do null checks. Now, that's maybe a stretch and maybe a nice goal to get to, but for the most part, we try to avoid having null checks. Now, in a test, it's the exact opposite. In a test, when I instantiate objects, I really want to be able to pass in nulls to the constructor to basically tell the reader that these parameters are irrelevant for this test. You know, there might be a different test where those parameters are not null and some other parameters are null, but for this test, it's irrelevant. So in your tests, your nulls are your friends, but in production code, it tends to be your enemy. Same thing for the new operator, right? If you instantiate an object in your production code directly, then you're basically uh, preventing anybody from giving you a mock, a friendly, or controlling that construction. That's why we don't want to do a new operator in a constructor like we saw with the, with the document and new HTTP client. It's much better to ask for the HTTP client. Better yet, forget the HTTP client, ask for the thing that you want, which is the document. So your production code really should not be, should have all these, be, be devoid of new operators. Instead, the new operators need to all be inside of either your factories or inside of your tests. Because test is all about instantiating some sub portion of your application so that you can go and poke on it. So in summary, you want to abandon the new operator. Uh, pretty much in 99% of your cases. Now there are certain places where new operator is perfectly OK. Instantiating a hash map, there's no problem with that. There's no need to ask for it in the constructor. Just go ahead and instantiate it. Uh, same thing for a collection. Uh, instantiating what I would call a value object, such as a user, totally not a problem. Just simply make a user. The key with these objects is that they're all leaps of your application graph. Right? There's nothing behind the hash map, really. It's the end of the road. That's why instantiating it is perfectly OK. But for the most part, your services, your, your objects that are responsible for uh, talking to each other and collaborating, those need to simply ask for their dependencies. Finally, because you're not responsible for constructing these things and you've really broken your application down into the phase of construction and the phase where the business logic lives, you should never be in the business of asking for anything that you don't directly need. Right? This is the law of Demeter. You should always be only asking for things that you need directly. Any kind of indirection that you place inside of your production code will make it so much harder for you to test your code from a, from a test. Because now you have to instantiate all of these intermediary objects and maybe mock them out and so on and so forth. And that cost becomes double the cost if that work is done in the constructor. So what's painful in the method, I can survive once. What's painful in the constructor is going to be shared by lots and lots of tests all over your application. <laughs>
So really you want to think of your objects as having come into two categories. There is your, your pile of business logic. This is the stuff that does work in your application. Uh, this is also where probably most of your bugs are in your application. You know, this is where the if statements are and the, the loops and you know, collaborations and so forth. Uh, you want to make sure that these objects are really easy to instantiate from a testing point of view. And then you have your pile of factories or the new operators uh, or the builders or, or so on and so forth. Now, by separating the two pieces out, you get an interesting, uh, from a testing point of view, it makes it really easy to test because you can always instantiate a business logic and pass in its dependencies and test it that way. And you can also instantiate a factory and ask the factory to produce a uh, object graph and assert that the object graph is correct without actually running any kind of code on there. If you mix the two, if you simply call the new operators wherever you feel like, then it, it's really hard to, to say, why don't you, I want to test to make sure that the instantiation of the database works correctly, but I don't want you to actually go off and call any kind of SQL methods on it. Uh, so, by having the separation, you can actually test both the factories and the, uh, the business logic in isolation. If you mix them together, uh, not so easy. It's very easy to basically call a method that, that starts doing the real work, instantiating more objects as it goes along, and they do more work, and so on and so forth. So, it turns out that our factories, if you follow the dependency injection the way it is recommended, it turns out uh, that it's really, really easy to instantiate things. You simply look at the constructor and you say, ah, in order to instantiate a house, I need to instantiate these other things. And in order to instantiate those, I need to instantiate so those other things, and on and on and on. As a matter of fact, the whole process is so automatic that you can build a framework that simply uses a reflection to look at the constructor and, says, and say, aha, in order to instantiate this, I need these other things. And in, this, in order to instantiate those, I need those other things, and so on, until you get a full closure. One such framework is Juice. And with Juice, you basically don't have to write your factories. You simply write your business logic that says, I need the following services to get my work done. And you assume that the Juice can basically look at the stuff using reflection and say, ah, I know how to put the pieces together because simply the pieces just ask for each other. So when you have these, these builders and these uh, business logic, right, small tests are become very easy to write and understand. And we kind of pointed it out. You can test everything in isolation, and you can test the factories in isolation. And you don't have to worry about the factory also doing the work or the, the work also instantiating other objects. Um, it also makes it so that because there is this set of factories that are responsible purely for wiring, it makes it very likely that if your business logic works, then chances are very good that the whole application works. Because the wiring, uh, especially with a strong, strongly typed comp uh, compiler, um, you can't really plug things in the wrong way. I mean, you, you can in some circumstances, but for the most part, all of the, the, the hard things are kind of compiled, checked for you. So in many cases, it's sufficient to simply have tests for your code and kind of assume that the whole thing works. Now, you probably don't want to just purely assume, and you probably want to have a couple of tests to make sure the wiring works together. But for the most part, if I have tests that prove that everything works in isolation, and I have a simple, one simple test that kind of proves one happy path to the application, I'm actually pretty confident that both the pieces work, and the wiring is correct, and it's probably working the way I intended to. And I believe that's it. So I am going to ask for questions now. No questions. You guys are all dependency injection experts. Well, I know you guys are. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for coming. Yes, question. Can you grab a mic? So on the null check thing, you mentioned that my test shouldn't need to create anything, instantiate anything that the code actually doesn't need. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one kind of a testing fake called a dummy. 
are you suggesting we will never need a dummy anymore? No, I'm not suggesting you don't need a dummy. So dummy would be like your null value object, correct? Is that what you mean by dummy? Dumb, dummy is something that only has the correct type. It doesn't instantiate, it doesn't implement any real method. Right, but it usually has uh, no ops for all the methods. Right, 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 right. right. So it's en essentially a null value object. So if you have a, uh, a class that expects to have a logger, and you don't want to actually log anything, I would pass in a dummy logger into, or null value logger into it. I'm actually talking about something slightly different. When, let me find the example again with, with the house and the painting. Here we go. Uh, a house might have a whole bunch of methods. For example, a house might have a lock method. And house also might have a paint method. When I call a lock method, presumably house has to collaborate with the doors and the windows in order to get the whole house locked down. So if I was to write a test for the lock method, I would pass in a real door and real windows because I wanted to assert that the whole locking process works. But if I'm painting the house, that method has nothing to do with doors or windows. So I shouldn't be forced to instantiate doors and windows inside of my test. Forgetting the whole problem of dummies, even if I have a dummy door hanging around, I still don't really want to instantiate it and pass it in because that kind of suggests to the reader of the test that somehow the door is involved in the whole painting process. Yeah, yeah for this code example, I understand, but like, what are the scenario you think will be a good case for a dummy object? You, you, you are you, suggesting uh, yeah. something about the logger okay. kind of thing. You, you, would like to, you would use a dummy object if you know that in your execution path, you are actually going to be dispatching on the parameter, which means a null would cause a null pointer exception. But you really don't care about this particular object because it's something like a logger or locks or, or something of that sort, in which case you just want a no operation to happen over there. That's what a dummy is for. Okay. So a dummy is needed when I dispatch it, but not, not use it. Right. Call it. A null is a much stronger form of a dummy because it says not only is it not needed, nobody's ever dispatching off of this thing. All right, guys. Thank you for coming. And if you have any questions, do email us. Thank <laughs> you.